Thanks for joining us. My name is Steve Swarzynski. I am a co-founder of EDS Wisconsin along with Tammy Cosmo. Um, to get started here, we'll a little stuff at the beginning that we need to do. Uh, information we're providing today is for educational purposes only. EDS Wisconsin is not a healthcare provider and does not provide medical advice or treatment. Information provided by EDS Wisconsin is not a replacement for care from a doctor or other healthcare provider. Please talk with your healthcare provider about your personal diagnosis and treatment options. All contributors cannot be held responsible for misinformation, misconduct, or malpractice. Information provided is not a substitution for medical care or advice. How have we gotten that out of the way? <laughs> uh, who is EDS Wisconsin? Um, EDS Wisconsin, we were organized uh, just about a year ago now. Uh, we're coming up on our first anniversary of being officially uh, incorporated. Uh, our mission is to provide support and resources to Wisconsin patients and medical professionals about Ehlers Danlos Syndrome and related conditions uh, via education and research. Um, we are fiscally sponsored by Chronic Pain Partners, also known as EDS Awareness. They are a uh, Nonprofit organization out of Ohio uh, who are also doing great work uh, to, to provide services and, and resources uh, for, for individuals. Uh, we are, of course, are always seeking volunteers and donors. And you can find more information about us on the web at eswi.org. Currently, uh, we have over 30 passionate and dedicated volunteers that are working with us across the state of Wisconsin and across the country. Uh, we have four medical advisors uh, that work with us very closely, uh, as well as a dedicated research team that is trying to find new information, new articles, new research uh, that is being done around the world and putting it together uh, for, for everybody to access more easily. Uh, we currently are running two support groups, one in Wausau and one in Milwaukee. Our Wausau group has been meeting since last May, I believe it is. Was that first? September? Okay. We had some, some focus groups in May, I think that's what I was confusing with. Um, and the Milwaukee group has had, I believe, three uh, meetings now uh, and is rapidly growing uh, and expanding their reach. Uh, we do have a goal of reaching five support groups throughout the state, um, which will include Green Bay, um, Madison, and Eau Claire as the target areas, uh, as well as providing specific information for kids and teens. Uh, in May 2017, uh, we hosted a, another presentation in this room, which was Five Ways to Reduce Persistent Pain. Uh, that was presented by Dr. Linda Lustein, uh, who was also part of today's presentation. Uh, we have ran the Health, Hope, and Healing for the Holidays that uh, gathered donations uh, for people in need. Uh, we helped uh, a number of families that included nine children and nine adults throughout the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we have also released uh, three newsletters so far, one last fall, one this past spring, and then just uh, within the last couple of weeks, one specific for uh, parents uh, and teachers uh, with the Taylor's Damage children. We do have a number of uh, events coming up uh, in the near future here. The next uh, major event for us after today is Megan's Walk. EDS Awareness and Suicide Prevention. That will be May 5th here in Wausau. Uh, it will be at Oak Island. Uh, if you want more information on that, please see us afterwards. Um, we'll be able to get that for you. In the fall, we're going to be doing a mini conference. And then we're going to be having another event in winter of 2018. We're not sure what that's going to be yet. We will take it, uh, your recommendations or advice if you have some input and something you'd like to see in particular. EDS Wisconsin, the board is Tammy Kozbob. I know a number of you already know Tammy fairly well in various ways. Uh, it's also myself, Steve Swarzynski, and Gilo Shaner. Uh, the three of us are the, the primary thrust behind uh, the day-to-day -day workings of, of EDS Wisconsin. 
Joining us today is, is Dr. Linda Bluestein. Um, she is a very knowledgeable uh, individual when it comes to uh, Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, uh, connective tissue disorders, and a wide variety of other, other concerns. Uh, very passionate, uh, very concerned, and very informative. Also today is Stephanie Gadel, uh, who is a volunteer for EDS Wisconsin. She is also a blogger and advocate uh, for patients and uh, EDS awareness. Um, she will be uh, coming up to talk in just a minute. And um, well, actually, let's just welcome her up. Stephanie, why don't you come on up? And I'll hand you this. Thank you all for being here. I'm really only wearing this microphone for the sake of the recording. According to my mother, I don't know how to whisper, so this is sort of unnecessary. But thank you for having me. Um, I actually kind of found Tammy through the internet, um, as probably many of you did. Um, met Tammy actually only once in person before today in Las Vegas, which is weird since we're both from Wisconsin. Um, but anyway. Uh, my presentation today is just a little bit on what actually EDS is. Uh, many of you probably already know, um, but my presentation is called What on Earth is This EDS? Um, I'm not a doctor. I don't pretend to be. I told my doctor last week I'm not a doctor. I don't know what to do. And he started laughing and said, obviously you're not a doctor. I don't know what that meant exactly. <laughs> Whatever you want to take it. I like to think I'm funny. I'm probably not funny, but that's totally your call. Me laughing or not laughing. Um, yesterday, my office assistant said to me, "You're such an inspiration," which I generally never know what to say to. But I said to her what I usually say, which is, after you get diagnosed with something like this, you have two choices, which is you either keep living with this condition, or you stop living and you still have this condition. So that's pretty much it. I mean, it doesn't go away. And so after my diagnosis, uh, those are my choices. Uh, so here is my very brief introduction. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Stephanie Gale. I'm actually on the city council in the city of Whitewater. I won my first election when I was 20 years old and became the chair of the Alcohol Licensing Committee. So my favorite joke to tell is that I could issue you a liquor license but if you sold me liquor, I would take it away. Uh, I also run a student <laughs> rental company, and I can tell you a lot of stories about student tenants, and they are all very funny, and many of them involve toilets. So just add alcohol. Alcohol is a central theme of my life, and usually not related to me consuming it. I'm obsessed with my dog. My dog was prescribed to me by my doctor, and usually we all need moments of dog rights, so this slide includes photos of her. This is Essex. She, this shirt says, Papillons make me happy, you not so much, because I just love her so much, but I had to put her in here because she's not here with me today. Um, I am 27, I am an EDS patient. I was diagnosed at 25. The major onset of my symptoms was when I was 12 years old, so it took me a long time to get diagnosed. The biggest issues I deal with in my life, obviously chronic pain, as many of you do. I have huge gait and mobility issues, probably 50 to 60% of the time I use um, a cane or smart crutches. I have serious degeneration in my foot, ankle, and knee joints, as well as degenerative disc disease and currently dealing with some worsening scoliosis. Um, I have gastroparesis, which is my most recent diagnosis, which has been also sort of fun to get diagnosed with. Um, some anxiety disorders, and fun new one, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. So, yay. But for me, activism, awareness, and helping other patients, as he mentioned, has been really life-changing. Um, the one thing that I do that I'm very passionate about is writing and speaking about my experiences. Um, I write a lot on my personal Facebook. After my diagnosis, I wrote a lot about what I was going through, and I've always done that. It makes some people really uncomfortable. Uh, the city manager for the city of Whitewater actually once said to me, our staff doesn't know how to handle you because you are very honest. And I was like, uh... Oh, okay, well, I, I don't really feel comfortable not telling you how I feel. And so what I've done is I write about what's happening. And then Tammy actually approached me and asked if I wanted to start writing for EDS Wisconsin. 
And so I do, I write on the blog. And I write what I'm going through, and I write things that I've been through, and I hope a lot that other people are able to benefit from that. And so when she asked me today if I wanted to share with people what EDS actually is, I said yes. Because when I was 12 and 13 and 14, and experiencing major dislocations on a regular basis, I had no idea. I remember the first time my kneecap went around to the back of my leg, and I thought it was going to stay there. And I was so scared, I was screaming and crying, and I didn't even know what a dislocation was, nonetheless what EDS was. And so that's why I want this to be different. I want to change. Right before we came out here, we were talking about why we do this. And I told a story, because I do, I tell stories, about my cousin's daughter. She's six years old, and she was diagnosed with EDS this year. And it, it, that's not a happy thing. But in some ways it is, because when I was six, I didn't have access to the treatment that I needed. I didn't have access to things that could have prevented some of this degeneration. There were things that happened in my life that wouldn't have happened. And her mom wrote to me about a week ago because she'd read a post I made about my clinical depression. And she wanted me to know that the reason her daughter got diagnosed was because she kept reading all the things I was sharing on Facebook. And she said, hey, that's what's happening to my kid. And she took her to a doctor and she said, my cousin has this condition and I think my daughter does too. And now she is going to have what I never had. And for me, that matters. If I never help one other person get a diagnosis, it won't matter. If I never help anyone else, it won't matter because I helped her. So that's what we're here to do. So the basics of EDS, and probably most of you know this. EDS stands for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. There's some debate over how to pronounce Ehlers. Ironically, the city of Whitewater just hired a finance firm called Ehlers and Associates, so every week at meetings, I get to think about it. Uh, EDS is the abbreviation, not ED, which is abbreviations for several other conditions in the community. Uh, in college, I was treated for anorexia, so they uh, use that for other things. Um, collagen, which before I was diagnosed with EDS, I thought was just used in hair products, like this one. Um, it's our enemy, our weakness, which I like to call the kryptonite to an otherwise incredible group of supermen and superwomen. EDS patients have only defective collagen, and usually until you figure out you have EDS, you don't realize the extent of its involvement in your body. It's in, you name it, it's probably part of that. Oops. Um, the ehlers danlos syndromes are a group of connective tissue disorders that can be inherited and are varied in how they affect the body and in their genetic causes, which is not my quote I borrowed from the ehlers danlos Society. So, don't think I stole that. I did borrow it, I did say. Common symptoms, joint hypermobility, which is the most common, that's the thing people think of. Uh, actually, the reason I finally was diagnosed was I was seeing a doctor, and I had my arms on the table, and he said, do you always sit like that? I said, do I always sit like what? And the rest of the story, as they say, is legend. Um, velvety skin, unstable joints, easy bruising. If I lift my skirt about three inches, the entire side of my thigh is currently bruised because I walked into my desk at work. Um, keloid scarring, fragile skin, poor wound healing. I had several leg surgeries in high school, which no one really knew why I needed them. I didn't ask why, but I did, and I had some major healing issues, which after my diagnosis, I, I talk about how I spent about a whole month reading about EDS and saying about every 15 minutes, oh my gosh, that makes sense. So all of these things make sense. There are a lot of different types of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Uh, they actually reclassified them just last year. Um, I'm still reading. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to delve into that because I'm not done reading about it and I'm not trying to present full medical information. But it is really interesting, and I would encourage reading about it if you're interested. The most common is what they call the hypermobile type, which presently cannot be genetically detected. Um, I am suspected to have classical Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. The waiting list in Madison for genetic testing is very long. Um, so I have, they haven't been able to formalize it, so my records right now say hypermobile, but it's very, uh, very likely I'm classical given the extensive uh, nature of my skin involvement. How many zebras are there? Um, many of you are aware of the zebra say in the EDS community. Uh, this is a fun picture. I had to put this in here. My staff at the office is very supportive of EDS awareness, and so at last May, um, I actually bought this shirt, and they all got excited, and they all bought them as well. 
um, says there is life after diagnosis, and so we all wore them on the same thing. Um, but at this time, research statistics of the other family syndrome do show that the total prevalence is 1 in 2,500 to 1 in 5,000 people. Um, the debate that I wrote here at the bottom is something that is pretty widely discussed in the EDS community. It's known as a rare disease, but there is some discussion of whether it's really rare or if it's just an underdiagnosed condition. Certainly, depending which type of EDS you have, it's probably more rare or less rare, depending which you have. This is the where the why the zebra discussion. Um, it is because you know doctors do struggle a little bit. The symptoms of EDS are symptoms of other conditions, and a lot of us were diagnosed with other things first, or not diagnosed at all because either they hadn't heard of it or it didn't occur to them. The bottom here, though, is that we aren't horses. We are zebra. And if you treat a zebra like a horse, you're going to have a problem. You can't approach a zebra in the wild and expect that you can saddle it and go for a ride. You will run into a problem. And so when I finally understood what was wrong with me, and I finally started getting the treatment I needed, it was life changing. Uh, my doctor said to me last week that I was still acting like the patient who didn't have a diagnosis. A doctor who knows you that well is indispensable, so just be aware of that. There are doctors like that out there, and some of your anxiety comes from people who are not like that, but they do exist. Joint hypermobility, um, I've heard from some doctors that EDS does not cause pain. And part of the problem is that constantly dislocating and subluxing your joints is painful. Um, this is a photo of a, a sublux knee. If you looked at my legs right now, you would see that uh, my be turning were pretty bad. Um, I had four reconstructive surgeries on my legs before I was actually diagnosed. Um, most of my doctors now have indicated that they likely would not have done those had they been aware of the diagnosis because they simply haven't worked. Um, they've re pretty much reversed at this point. Um, but joint hypermobility is something to be keenly aware of. Um, once you're diagnosed, you really have to pay attention to it because it's not good. I still find myself sitting in rooms with my arms like they were in that you know, diagnosis table room on March 14, 2016. Uh, and think, okay, stop bending your elbows like that, you're going to hurt yourself. Comorbid conditions. Um, most people with EDS don't just have EDS. It's really fun. Um, we typically have multiple conditions. I like to call them onuses. Um, Actually, what is interesting in my case is that I was actually diagnosed with mast cell activation condition before I was diagnosed with EDS. Um, I had all sorts of allergies, as we discussed, that no one could ever trace. Um, I would go into actual, like, I would have episodes of like anaphylaxis that they just couldn't isolate and scratch test would never work. Um, but some other issues that we can run into, I mean, POTS, obviously. Um, those kinds of things, gastroparesis, um, anxiety disorders are much more prevalent in EDS. So we deal with a lot of additional condition. And having doctors who are aware of not just EDS, but the other symptoms and other conditions that you can have in addition to them are important. Also, that thing is important, so I put me <laughs> What does this mean and how do I get diagnosed? I couldn't put everything in this slide and I'm not a doctor. The first thing I will say is that I gave up probably five different times trying to figure out what was happening to me. And a lot of people kind of thought I was exaggerating. I didn't experience that people didn't believe me. I'm thankful for that. I know that there are a lot of people who go through being fully disbelieved. In my instance, it was more, is it really that bad? But I didn't give up. In my case, bizarrely, my boss is a very mentor type boss. And I was dislocating things and falling down in my office. Walking from a desk to another desk, like a distance of 15 feet. And he said, you can't do this anymore. This isn't safe anymore. And the last time I had seen a doctor, all he said was, I really can't see anything wrong, but your legs are really crooked. I could break them for you and straighten them if you want. And I wasn't going to do that. And so my boss said, you need to go to a different doctor. We have to send you somewhere else. I'm scared. And he convinced me to go, even though I was scared. 
And he told me that no matter what happened, I was still going to have a job when I came back. And no matter what happened, people who cared were still going to be there when I got back. And so I went. And a friend told me I had a year two years before this, mind you. She's, she's not a doctor. But she told me because she had it and she knew. And I didn't listen because I didn't want it to be true. And so when I went to see this doctor and he said all these things, I said, don't tell me I have EDS. And he laughed and he was like, how do you even know what that is? And I told him the story and he said, yeah, I'm pretty sure you do. And they ruled out everything else and put the diagnosis on there for me to the genetics clinic, which was a pause. You can see two years ago and I still don't have that happen. But well, long story short is there are a lot of things that are important about having a diagnosis. And you can't, the reason we're here today is because your anxiety is real, and it's valid, and it's important, but it can't stop you from getting what you need, and it needs to be handled. Because there are things about having EDS and other complex medical issues, like getting EKGs, because EDS can cause heart problems, <laughs> that you need to do for your own safety and your own health. And when I found the right doctors, my anxiety didn't go away, but it did get reduced. I found ways to cope with it, and you're gonna learn even better ways to cope with it, because I found people like you guys who are in my life, and I found ways to make it better. It's, and I, I read a quote the other day that said, it's never going to get better, but you are going to get better at handling it. And that is what I found to be so important. This is my guide to dealing with it. Uh, I try to make funny things, like uh, Kylie Jenner tried to turn my back brace into an outfit. Uh, <laughs> so that's my who wore a best EDS edition. Um, the frustrating part about this is that when someone says you have EDS, it's not like when someone says you have strep throat and they write you a prescription for 10 days of penicillin. It usually means you're about to get 15 more doctors. And you might suddenly understand things. And I talk about how when I first got diagnosed with PDS, I was elated. Like I was happy and I understood everything and I was so excited. Suddenly it hit me that I was incurable and I could not process and I couldn't deal with it. I can't even handle it right now that I'm depressed. I don't even think it's true. But it is. The pain is a lot. It is hard to be in pain all the time. It is hard. I don't look like anything is wrong with me. I hear all the time, but you look fine. You're young and you're pretty and you run a city. You can't be sick. <laughs> well, I mean, spoiler alert, it wasn't true. Like, like okay, is there a coupon I can cash in that's like gonna like, get me out of that? Like, I didn't know that there was like a you're too pretty way to like avoid this. If that's possible, I'm willing to do that, but I don't think it's an option. But the thing is, None of you are really alone. Even if you're alone at the doctor, you're not alone. Most of us have been there or are there now. We're complex and we're anxious for very valid reasons. And like I said, we might have really weak collagen, but we've already been through the really hard part. And the fact that we're still here and we're in this room means that we're really strong. And I think what Tammy's about to go through, I've, I've seen what she's about to tell you, and I wish that when I was going through what I did, I would have heard it because I think it would have helped me. I think I could have been diagnosed sooner if I had heard what those tools were. And I'm excited for you guys.
hideous senses that have never mind since I even knew, before I even knew what Taylor Samuel syndrome was. Um, and that's because ever since I was a young child, <coughs> I watched my family members go through this, and I watched the devastation that it can cause in a family and, and to, to everybody involved. I made the conscious decision that I will never give up hope, because I know that there's people who are home, in pain, undiagnosed, and they're feeling helpless and hopeless. And that needs a staff. We can't have that. There's also medical professionals who are also suffering because they don't know what to do with us. They're not familiar with ailer samples. They don't know what ailer samples is and what to do with their medically complex patients. There's a lack of research in the ailer samples community, and there's also a lack of support and resources for our medical professionals. <laughs> Currently, the combined efforts of individuals and organizations around the world, such as EDS Awareness, EDS Wellness, the Ailer Samples Society, the Hypermobility Syndrome Association, Dr. Bluestein, and so many more people are working towards developing better diagnosis, treatment, and management options. But we're not there yet. We need a lot more research education, support, and resources for people who are happy or samples. <coughs> we all must start working together to find the best solutions to manage, manage and treat the varying symptoms of medically complex patients, and we need to do this now. Last year, I went to um, EDS Wellness's program called Wellpalooza, where um, they had to learn a lot about ehlers Danlos and the comorbid conditions. And the night before the program, at the men's hotel room, scrolling through Facebook before I was going to bed, and what I saw was that a friend of mine, her sister, had passed away. And I know that this friend of mine has Taylor Sandlows, and she has dysautonomia that's pretty severe. And it was really devastating to me to think that of all the things that I'm doing, that this has been a passion of mine, I was so close. Like, it was literally the night before going to all the blues up. And I'm like, so excited I can bring all this stuff back to help people. <coughs> but for her, it's too late. Her name's Megan. And Megan's initiative is a big part of EDS Wisconsin. And what Megan's initiative is, is to develop support resources now to get the education out there. We can't wait. We can't wait until next week. We can't wait till next year. Like, whatever we can do, we have to do it now. And, and that's for Megan. That's Megan's initiative. So the reason we're having this event today is because ever since I graduated from school, from college, um, with my degree in healthcare management, um, so ever since um, I graduated, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of patients on the phone. And what I noticed right away is that 99% of them had anxiety about appointments. And it didn't matter if the appointment was the next day, if it was with the regular doctor, if it was in six months from now, people are so worried about their appointments and is the doctor gonna believe me? What am I gonna say? What's important? What's not important? Are they gonna know what ALS Danlos is? And, and even if you have a diagnosis, sometimes they tell you that you don't have a diagnosis. <coughs> but there's like a lot of reasons why people have anxiety. And I know that just going to the doctor, it, 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 it's such a huge thing. So hopefully we can help you, giving you some tips and tools to make those appointments less anxiety provoking. So Dr. Lucine did, did a couple of surveys recently. One was, um, in towards patients and their 
anxiety and one was aimed towards doctors and anxiety. Um, I think something that I, we may not realize is that doctors also have anxiety about their appointments, with us especially, because for, for a lot of reasons. The, the same reasons that we have anxiety for going, going to see them. There's so much information, and there's not a lot of management and treatment options. Um, so what she found in her survey was that 54% of the respondents felt that going to the doctor would be a waste of time because of past experiences. Facebook for doctors, but they check all your credentials. You have to be a doctor to be in this group. So you have to do the survey the way they, you know, you can do polls and things, but it's, it's I was trying to do a very um, similar comparison so that we get you know, data that was very comparable. Um, I do want to point out that probably the way that I titled the survey, I think that we might have had skewed results because we didn't ask people coming in for appointments. You know, um, we didn't take a random sample. These are people who chose to respond to a survey that was about appointment anxiety. So I think the results might be skewed a little bit because of that. Um, and then for the, uh, for the surveys that I did for physicians, the one that I posted on a bunch of different Facebook groups that I belong to that involve physicians, I only got eight responses. <laughs> um, but the one that I posted in the, uh, it's called Servo, I got 153 responses. And um, they 95% said that there are patients when they see them on the schedule that they just like, actually in, in um, the UK they call it heart sink. Um, because you just uh, try to figure out, like, okay, what am I going to do with this person? And, you know, how am I going to make this a positive encounter? And um, so they, I, then I asked, well, what is it that makes you feel that way when you see this person on your schedule? And there were a variety of different reasons. 54% was because they said that the patient's expectations and their expectations did not line up. So that would be a check. They knew in advance when they saw this person on their schedule that that would be a challenging thing. 45% um, said that they knew that the person was going to want to discuss more things than they would have time for, which I think actually is probably higher than that. Um, because that's, that's the biggest challenge, I think. And Tammy came up with a really good forum that we'll talk about for that. So those are kind of the main things that I want to mention. So appointment anxiety is not new to me. Um, my mother actually passed away when she was 50 years old. She was never diagnosed with anything. She always knew something was wrong. And for years and years, she had this frustration. I was a child, and I saw her going to appointments and being upset. And there's even one time she was arrested at a doctor's office because she was so mad at them. She broke, uh, she either punched the wall or broke a picture or something like that. And it, it's frustrating. And, you know, I, I cried before my appointments, after my appointments, during my appointments. And it, it's not because I'm depressed or, or whatever. I mean, it's just, it can be so frustrating. Um, not only that, but I also feel that way when I take my kids to the doctors. So it's not only affecting us, it's affecting our families, our children, our caregivers. Um, so I don't claim to be an expert, but um, I've been to several EDS conferences, 
Um, I've raised money to go to most of these conferences, um, but, but I've been determined to do this, and I don't think people should be suffering. Um, I created the Ehlers Danlos and Joint Hypermobility on Facebook, um, the Wisconsin group, in 2011, and it brought to almost 800 members, which is awesome. Um, it's such a great group. Um, I do have a healthcare management degree, and I'm enrolling in a master's program in healthcare policy and law this fall. Um, I'm currently employed as a plant manager. And this past year has been so amazing. I was able to meet Dr. Catherine, Dr. Maitland, um, Kendra from EDS Wellness, and Dr. Lucy. We, we only met a year ago, which is amazing. <laughs> so, this is Don. Don's a general contractor. Don builds houses. And this is Peter. Peter's a homeowner. And Peter comes into Don's office and he says, Hey Don. Something ha something's happening in my house. My beams feel unsafe in the basement. I have wires hanging all over. Water all over, there's holes in the walls, I have glass all over, there's no light in my house, the heaters are working, I have no refrigerator, there's only one burner working on my stove, and there's books all over the place, and I lost my favorite teddy bear. And this is Peter, and, and this is how he's feeling. And he's like, oh my gosh, this is so awful. But this is what Don sees. All that stuff that he described is on the inside. And Don's looking. And this is what he sees. This is what Peter goes home to. And this is what Peter experiences. So that's a lot like what medically complex patients go through. We have normal test results. We have normal x-rays. And as much as the doctors want to believe us, all the evidence and what they can see, it doesn't look like they're leaving. What is it that Peter wants? That same thing is like what patients want. Um, patients, we do not want to have pain in other debilitating symptoms. Does that sound right? We want to know what's wrong. We keep, we keep being told that nothing's wrong. We know something's wrong. We have pain. We have things going on. And they keep telling us that nothing's We want to be relieved, and a lot of this information we actually got from our focus groups that we did last year uh, about what patients need and what patients want. Um, so we want to be relieved. Um, we've been to so many places where maybe they want to believe us, but, but they just don't, or they think that it's not that bad. Uh, validation. Um, they got to this. <laughs> like, I know I'm dealing with this and experiencing this, and it, it would just be nice if somebody would understand that. And reassurance. Peter wants to go home to a safe home. We want to be reassured that it's going to be okay, that we're going to be okay, that our kids are going to be okay, and that, that the future is going to be okay that we're gonna be safe. What is it that the doctor wants? <laughs> <laughs> we wanna be able to fix people. I mean, we, I teach at the medical college and every single uh, medical student that I teach, every single physician friend that I have, they want to be able to fix things. Um, we're in a time where uh, people are living longer, so more and more medical problems are coming up. People are having to deal with more and more multi-systemic things, so they affect you know, your cardiovascular system and your musculoskeletal system and your neurologic system and autonomic nervous system and things like that. But yet we're in a system where uh, things like procedures and surgeries are the things that are well compensated. So the medically complex patient, which, which EDS is kind of just a classic example, and probably relates to a lot of people here, but we don't know maybe there's going to be some people online that 
people here that have other things going on that are medically complex. Um, but our current uh, healthcare system is just not well designed for the medically complex patient. They need time and they need a lot of things that are challenging for us to, to provide. Um, we, we want to help people. We want to uh, be able to figure out what's wrong. Um, for me personally, I feel better when somebody says to me, um, I know you might not be able to fix it, but just even knowing that you believe me um, really helps. And I can tell you that I don't think very many people say that. So if you say that to your doctors, it kind of gives them a break because I know it may seem like, well, why can't we figure out what's wrong? It's a lot harder than you think. Um, because you can speculate, but, but we're held to a standard of, you know, we should not be putting a diagnosis on the chart unless we have good evidence to think that you have that condition. So um, there's lots and lots of restrictions that we have to deal with right now. Um, I just came across a statistic that um, last year, doctors spent 52 hours logging onto their EMR. So it's a lot of, you know, every time you go, if you're rounding in the hospital, every time you leave one patient and go to that, you have to log in, log out, log in, log out. It's, you know, we're dealing with a lot of regulations, a lot of complexities, and, um, and we also, it, it's nice if people can come in organized, and then we're going to get to that a little bit later too, but the more you can organize, what, did it, what are your goals for the appointment, that really helps us a lot, because um, I had an appointment the other day with somebody, um, it lasted five hours, and there was still more that we could have talked about, you know, so uh, you definitely, the more organized that you can be, the more you can prioritize, um, the, the better that is for, for us. The more we can help you leave with what it was that you really wanted when you came in. And also I think to understanding and having realistic expectations that no matter how long the visit is, even after five hours, we didn't get to everything. So understanding that you know, you're not going to be able to get to everything, so focusing on what's important. So some of the basic strategies that um, we think about as ways to reduce appointment anxiety is you have to start at a good place. You have to be able to reduce your anxiety in general, first of all. And I know a lot of people who have a syndrome. syndrome. Um, actually, Angie was just putting out a new uh, article about how persons who are medically complex have a lot of strategies already to help them to reduce anxiety. I'm pretty sure that we have copies of that article out there. Um, so um, probably a lot of stuff that, that you guys might already know, but believe. Believing, have faith, and acceptance. Um, believing that things can get better, believing that your plans can go well, and believing that there are answers and solutions out there. Okay. Um, self-forgiveness. I'm really big on self-forgiveness because um, when I was younger, I had, when I was younger, I had, uh, I was actually seeing a therapist. I, I was about 24 years old, which was actually quite a while ago. My kids were little. And I knew that I wanted my kids to grow up to be happy. And I was trying to figure out how, how can I make sure that my kids are happy when they get older. And the only thing that I could come up with was that I have to be happy myself. And so I needed to learn how to be happy myself. So I went to a therapist. And when I was with the therapist, we talked about quite a few things, but he did do one thing um, that's kind of a meditation, we have this kind of thing, it's called EMDR, it's the eye movement desensitization that helps to form new connections in your brain for past tra traumatic experiences. So when I was a kid, so that things happened to me, we did the EMDR, and ever since that day, ever since that day, I have felt so much better because those things that happened to me when I was a kid and traumatic experiences can really hold us back as individuals. If we think that those things happen to us because of us, 
that then we start blaming ourselves and feeling guilty and feeling bad. And I think this relates to doctor's appointments because we might have a genetic condition and medical problems, but that doesn't mean that it's our fault. So if we can find a way to forgive ourselves, that can help us a lot in our appointments. But not only can it help us, it can help us. When we can forgive ourselves, we can also forgive the doctor. We can forgive them for not knowing and not having all the answers and solutions for us. So forgiveness and self-forgiveness is super important. <coughs> Visualizing success. Um, to have a good appointment, you have to be able to visualize it. If you're going to think that your appointment is not going to go well, you probably won't. Um, education. Knowledge is power. The more that you know, the less anxiety that you'll have. And we have this picture of a girl on a roller coaster. I think it's the first time that you ever saw a roller coaster. And think of the first time you saw a roller, or saw a roller coaster, and it was really scary. But then your mom and your dad or your brothers and sisters started telling you about the roller coaster and how safe it is and that people have been going at roller coasters for years. And the more information that you have about the roller coaster, maybe you finally went on the roller coaster and have a good time. Um, so education and knowledge can be very empowering. So one thing that is good to know is to know your doctor. Personality, I put first. Personality, every doctor, even doctors within the same clinic, they can all think very differently and have very different personalities. Some doctors are open to learning new things, other doctors are not. Um, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely true, and you know, it's kind of like dating. If you are going to somebody and you don't feel like you're getting anywhere, you know, then vote with your feet and you know, find somebody else. But I think also too to keep in mind that you know, doctors are people too. We have bad days. We have our own things going on that you know. Um, so also kind of just think about how you how you approach things and. Um, I think it's important to, because people mirror that there are people that come in. Um, my husband's a physician also. Um, he does much more straightforward things. He's a urologist. But he has people come into his office for an initial appointment he's never seen them before, and they are so angry. And it's really hard for him not to be affected by that. You know, we're affected by people's body language and, and things like that. So um, Definitely different personalities, but also just kind of keep in mind what are you projecting outwards, you know, towards that person, um, because they probably do want to want to help you. And I thought it was um, good to talk about the other the other people in the room because we all have none of us have unlimited time, so um, time factors are very very important. And um, you know things like liability. There's certain things that we can and can't do. Um, you know, I wish I could do whatever I wanted for for people, but there are you, know, you have to be careful that you stay within the law, you don't commit malpractice, obviously, that you do um, evidence practice evidence-based medicine. So if somebody comes in for XYZ, they may want to try something that really there's not good evidence for, and you need to really kind of go through and try some other things first. Um, depending on, you know, you might come across a study that's a case report, um, which isn't going to be as um, well founded as something like a randomized controlled double blind trial or a meta-analysis or you know these are the things that we have to look at and especially it depends on the risk if something is relatively safe then for me i don't need anywhere near as much evidence to um, recommend that to the patient or prescribe it or whatever but the more risky something is the more evidence you need to um, actually you know enact that type of treatment so keep that in mind um, Another thing I want to mention while we're on this is, you know, a lot of people will come in and they will have done tons and tons and tons of research, which is which is great, and I I, I like it when people have ideas. How you 
approach that though is really important. So you know, you can say it in a way to, that the other person is going to get defensive 99 times out of 100. Um, you can say, hey, I was reading about something and I brought a copy. Bring them a copy if you can, because that's really helpful. Say, you know, I'm going to leave this with you, or maybe even give it to the, you know, whoever's putting you in the room, give it to them and say, hey, I was wondering if, if you know, the doctor has time, maybe they can take a look at this. Um, it's something that I, you know, and, and, and say maybe, you know, I, I would be willing to discuss that at my next visit. You know, again, understand that, that they have limitations too. They, they're not going to be able to read that before they come in and see, probably. So, you know, you give it to them and you say, hey, could you read this? If you would be willing to read this, it would be very beneficial. Um, so is everybody familiar with what evidence-based medicine is? Yeah. Okay. So pretty much what evidence-based medicine is, is that since the development of electronic medical records, they take people who have a certain diagnosis, say high blood pressure, and they'll go through all these people, they'll take out their names, so it's de-identified information, and they'll say, this 10,000 people tried this, this 10, 10,000 people tried that, and they'll look at all the different data uh, of what people have tried. And they'll look at the outcomes, patient outcomes. So if a lot of people, or the majority of people, have, have success with a certain kind of treatment or management option, that's something that's going to be recommended before another option. So in the past, I mean, you think, I don't know, in the 80s, doctors really, they had all these things available to them, but they actually had a lot more say in what they wanted to try. Now we have a lot more information. I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of data out there about what works and what's good for people. So even if we want to try something different, there may be a lot of evidence pointing to something else that we should try. Not only that, but insurance companies want us to try those things first. Um, especially, you know, they think about cost too. Um, what's the least expensive that gives the biggest result? <coughs> so I think that's something that's really important to keep in mind. Um, when I was in college, I did a paper about a pay for performance, and I'm not really sure if that's, there might be varying forms of that being done now, but pay for, pay for performance is where they offer to pay medical professionals more money to have better outcomes. So maybe in the surgical room, if there's less infections afterwards, and things like that. And, you know, it, it, it really has a patient in mind saying, well, if we have better outcomes in these situations, there's less likelihood that they're going to come back. So they did this pay, pay for performance, <laughs> P for P, is how it died, for a few years, and then they started evaluating the results. So what they found is that the outcomes didn't change. The outcomes of what the doctors and other medical professionals were doing didn't change. And what they concluded from those studies is that doctors do the best job that they can. Um, doctors don't go to medical school. You know, I mean, it, it, it's long, it's hard, it, they put in a lot of hours. It's not an easy thing. And they found that those doctors are going to school because they actually want to help people. And that there's nothing that we can do that's going to help them work harder to make us better. Well, now it's morphed into meaningful use, and we get deducted for not meeting certain things. So, as we have seen in the OR, if you didn't give the antibiotic 95 or 98% of the time in a certain interval, again, they're looking at the EMR. If you, for the first few years, it was, you know, you get it, whatever the bonus was, 1% or whatever, but now you get deducted. So, you get a penalty now if you don't meet these certain criteria. But they just have to pick. They just pick certain things to look at. You, know, it's, you can't look at everything. And so, so that's what it is now. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, but wouldn't that be against, though, people who are complex and not, we're not going to necessarily respond to any anesthesia the right way or the antibiotics. And so we're going to skew that and we're going to cause a negative to the doctor because our outcome is different. That's true. So, 
Yeah. And, and that's why that's why we bring this up here because for the majority of patients, just know that. Yes, just know that that, that that's what they're dealing with. Yeah. And they think of the example of the homeowner and the contractor. So that contractor is typically dealing with someone coming in with a pretty easy problem, like they, they have an electrical problem. So the contractor's like, okay, I'm gonna send your electrician done, or here's a light bulb. They, can, they really can't do that to us, for us. And, and it's hard, you know. Well, what, what is, so I'm trying to do a better way to explain this. Sometimes I forget, like, to start at the beginning, but, you know, again, as an anesthesiologist, what, what meaningful use, when I was in the OR, what that was, was they pick things that they can measure that they think are important. Because you can't, you, can, you can't, if you wait, if you spend so much time on analysis, so, you know, they have to, so they, they, they picked antibiotics, and then they picked um, infections from central lines, but we would put central lines in. So then we had to do, they would look to see, did you put on full, did you put a full drape on the patient, were you gowned and gloved, and you know, all of these things. But the challenge is it's a lot easier to, um, to measure if somebody did something than to measure the outcome of it. Because that's the other thing to keep in mind is, your doctor can do everything right and something bad can happen. Your doctor can make a mistake and you can be okay. So the core, it's not a perfect correlation, you know, uh, so, so that's the thing that's really challenging with that. And um, there are people that are working on now value-based care. So for a given condition, like EDS, and what is the outcome, and how much did it cost to get that person better? So there's places like in, um, in Europe, headache clinics, where they look at how much did it cost to treat each of these people for headaches, and then what was the outcome? So that's, that's value. How much did you spend and what was the outcome? And that's really what we should be doing. And there are some people, there's a, um, he spoke actually at the last ASA conference that I was able to go to. Michael Porter, I believe his name is, and he's a Harvard um, a PhD, and he, he's written a bunch of books and things like that. But anyway, he talks about that a lot. And hopefully that's the way healthcare is going because we've been doing all these tweaks and it's not working. You know, we're not serving people well enough. So another thing that uh, we need to think about that our doctors are dealing with on a daily basis are drug seekers. There are drug seekers who are coming in. They don't look any different than you or I. There's no way for that doctor to know if you have an addiction problem. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind that, that they are I want to say, I want to say there are, there are, but it's hard. It's hard to sort that out. Yeah. Mm, yeah. It, it, it's pretty. Well, is there behavior that we can avoid <laughs> to, 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 to come up to, so that you don't appear like a drug seeker? I can tell you certain things that, you know. Um, like, seriously, yeah. Yeah. No, I had someone recently that tested positive for heroin, fentanyl, um, codeine, and so, anyway, and, and they had come to me with a letter and said, my insurance company has approved this narcotic and this is what I want. And already, in my mind, I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not feeling comfortable with this person. I feel like something's going on, and I had seen them several times. And then when they showed me that letter, I was like, and we were, you know, entering into the situation. I was like, oh, and when I knew we had to do a urine test, and I wasn't surprised when it came back positive for all those things. But um, when you start to say specific things like that, um, you know, again, it's it's also your your body language when you. If you're more open and you're like, and you're more relaxed, which I know is easier said than done, right? I had a patient tell me that um, they came to me from Green Bay, and she said I did not sleep at all last night because I was so nervous about meeting you, and it made me feel so bad, you know, like that, you know, I think she was that nervous. But um, so, so right, I, I I understand what you're saying, and I think that that's a big thing. Though. If you if you are open-minded, you're like I I want to I want to do show that you will be compliant, and I want to actually, this is a good opportunity to, to mention about compliance. I'm actually okay with people if they come back and they weren't compliant, if they explain to me why. Right. You know, and if they're respectful about it, but if they're like, you know, kind of, you know, if they say, well, I know we talked about this last time, but I decided not to do that, and this is why, I'm okay with that, you know. So I think it has to do with communication and, and respecting each other as people. Relationship building. Right. Personalities. Um, you're not going to get where you want to be in one appointment. I mean, relationships with people, anyone that we know, I mean, you can't trust them just from knowing them once. Um, it, it's something that you have to keep going back.
that you have to develop these relationships. And I know, even for myself, a long time ago, like I did go from doctor to doctor to doctor, like primary care doctor, because you know I just wasn't getting what I wanted or needed or or I didn't feel how I wanted to feel at my first appointment. But maybe you won't. But if you have a doctor who is open-minded and who's willing to work with you and listen to you, go back. Maybe they don't know. And, and, and it doesn't even have to be your primary care doctor. It can be a GI, it can be any of them. I mean, like, my best doctor for the longest time was my GI doctor. Um, I knew he wanted to help me. We had a relationship. And, you know, I, I've always been honest with him. And, you know, if I wasn't compliant with the medication or something, I would tell him. Um, but that's part of building those relationships. <laughs> um, we have to think about doctors may not be able to believe us. So when I was a teenager, my mom was in the hospital, she had surgery, and they gave her all this medication, and um, it wasn't working. The doctor told us in the hallway, I remember standing out there with my stepdad and my sister, he told us that they gave her enough medication to knock out an elephant, and here she was still in pain. And as a, as a teenager, I wanted to believe my mom so badly, and there was just nothing that I could go on. There was no way that I could possibly know. And I really, really wanted to know, and I really wanted to believe her. There was no way. And, and so just know that as much as your doctor wants to believe you, it, and especially when we have test results that come back normal all the time, that, that they just might not be able to believe you as much as they want to. Um, later. <laughs> so the um, physician suicide, that's actually a really big problem. It's a huge problem. I, I teach at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and, and there's a male physician that just recently committed suicide um, in, in Milwaukee. And when I was at some training last summer, um, some people that were training with me had to leave to go to the funeral of a third year medical student that had committed suicide. It's a big, big problem. Um, and doctors know themselves. Yes. 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 It's there's, a big problem. There, there were three at Mount Sinai, three female physicians at Mount Sinai Hospital who about this recently, within a period of just a few months. That um, there's a lot of a lot of um, stressors that we deal with and, um, yeah, and we actually created a page of resources for today's event on EDS Wisconsin's website and that article is actually on there and, and I've actually seen a few different articles about this topic but I mean think about the fact that they're going to school for all these years to help people and you get done with college and you know if you're not able to help people yeah. yeah, you go through college, you go through medical school, you go through residency, and then you have all these other external pressures, and, you know, people are complex and challenging, and, and you're a perfectionist, and a lot of them have to do with something happened to somebody, um, and it's, you know, I think that's another misconception that I, that it's a good opportunity to just bring up. It's devastating to us when something doesn't go right. Um, I can think of one thing in particular that had happened to me, and it took me a long time to get over it. I mean, it is really devastating. You mean like the patients? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I just this little thing up there, right? The doctor, Seuss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Be who you are, because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. And my daughter actually helped me come up with this. Um, yeah, as we we're talking about this, because. If, if it's not working out with a doctor, it's not working out in a relationship, you know, you do have other options. Okay, so um, another thing to keep in mind, and I mentioned earlier about doing research, a lot of times patients have, they, they, they know um, what's going on with themselves enough and do a lot of research and I just I wanted to point out that there was a study done back in 2002 
looking at um, how many articles, this is for uh, if you're a general practitioner, and that in a given month, the number of articles that were relevant to that person's profession were over 7,000 articles. And if that person was an epidemiologist, which if you're an epidemiologist, that means that you can more quickly digest the information in these articles. So if you were to you know, fully keep up and read everything that was relevant to your profession, every month you would spend 672.5 hours reading journals. So keep that in mind. If you come in and you say, hey, did you see X, Y, Z? You know, just keep that in mind. And I people bring in me things all the time now, which, which I, I, I like, but you know, I only have so much time. It takes a long time to document the you know, visits, and there's a lot of things that we have to do. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there. Some of it's good information, some of it's not good information, and it's, um, it's so getting not. more and more challenging as we have more and more. You know, because we keep adding to the literature, right? Things don't go away. Articles don't go away. We just keep adding. And so we add to that, I had a slide that um, showed the number of drugs that, you know, back in the, um, like, you know, early 1900s or whatever, you know, we had like five drugs. And now we have like six, over 6,000 drugs or, or, or more. So we have many, many more drugs. We have drugs that are put on the market, taken off the market. It's, you know, it's, things are very complex. So, so um, I know we've talked a lot about knowing your doctor, but I think that that, that education is important that we know these things are happening behind the scenes so that we don't have to take it personally that this doctor's rushing me through the appointment. He doesn't want to hear me or, or, or anything like that. Um, and, and that's the reason that we have given you this information about the doctor. The next part is knowing your patient. So for medical professionals, I think it's important that they know what their patient is going through, their medically complex patient is going through before they come to their appointment. So you're say the primary care doctor and you're going you have all these things going on, you have somebody who came in with struck throat. They had a temperature, a fever, and I'm going to the back of their throat, write out a prescription, they're done. The next person comes in have a broken toe <laughs> and you know how to fix that. And so then they come in, they see us, and we have all these things going on. Um, they need to not just look at that, but they need to look at what the patient is going through that day, during the appointment, before the appointment, after the appointment. I mean, this is, this is the patient's life. Daily symptoms, brain fog, headache, fatigue, joint pain, stomach pain, sensitive skin, allergies, IBS, dizziness, and more. So they, they need to know, like, we're experiencing this. And when we're experiencing this, it's super hard to know which of these symptoms is important. We have so many things going on, well, we're not sure what's important. So kind of like in the beginning where Peter was talking with Don, the contractor, and he's like, and I can't find my computer. <coughs> well, okay, <laughs> that's really, might not be a big deal, but to him, he doesn't know, like, maybe it's really important to him. Uh, and maybe it's not relevant, maybe it is. Um, and I know I felt like that before my diagnosis. Like, the doctor's like, why are you telling me this? Like, I, I have not tell me that. And I'm like, well, I don't know what's related. <clears throat> so I think it's important that the medical professionals know that this is why we're kind of, can be all over the place with explaining what's going on with us. Um, they should know that this might be our fifth doctor that we're going to this year, or this month, this week, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, that have, and, and we've not been believed by any of them, or they just brush us off, or we feel like we've been brushed off. Um, those symptoms are important, we went over that, medication metabolism. So the, um, they'll look at our charts and they'll say, well, they have all these things going on, and so-and-so gave, gave them this medication, and they have a problem with this medication, so 
when they tried this one, now they have a problem with this medication, and, and the list goes on and on. I think that they just don't want to be fixed. They don't want to take it. When actually, <laughs> a lot of medically complex patients have drug metabolism issues. And um, this can actually be tested for. Uh, for Wisconsin, I know that Badger Care covers a company called GeneSight. Wait, what's it called? <clears throat> GeneSight. Um, and that should be on that resource page for EDS Wisconsin. Um, we also have some flyers out on the table for, what's the name of that one? Perfect. That oh, Millennium Health. <clears throat> well, Millennium Health is who I use for uh, pharmacogenetic testing. Yeah. And um, are you talking about go for the um, event that's next month? Oh, yeah. There's a flyer out there, too, so, so they're having an event. But it's called pharmacogenetic testing. And that can help. It helps. There's not a whole ton of research in it, but it can help uh, them to understand why medication is not working for us. And it, have, it has nothing to do with us not wanting to take it. Um, not only that with the medication, so we can have sensitivity where we're metabolizing it too quickly or too slowly. We can also have actual allergies, which can be related to the mast cell. Um, once I learned about mast cell activation disorder and the medication metabolism problems that, that we can have, suddenly my list that's like huge, the drugs that I'm allergic to, I could sort them out between what I was sensitive to with my metabolism and what I was like actually allergic to. So if, if a patient has a long list, I would really suggest looking into the pharmacogenetic testing. <coughs> I think that medical professionals should also know that uh, people who have a lot of things going on, a lot of symptoms, may not be able to work. They need to be spending a lot of money on different things that they need to buy for their health care, maybe special food, medications, bracing, copays, deductibles, premiums. We all know about that. And also that their family members and children are also dealing with these things. And there's nothing more heartbreaking than to see your family members dealing with these kinds of things. Knowing about the laws, HIPAA, health insurance. I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> health, insurance. health insurance portability and accountability. Yeah. I know We just yeah, we know the general idea. Mm -hmm. So if we were talking, um, people in with UBS Wisconsin, I realize that a lot of patients um, don't understand or realize that there's these laws in place that can help them, actually. Um, your records. So if you're going to a new doctor's office, they don't necessarily have your records, and they do not have to have your records. If you're going to a new doctor's office, they don't necessarily have your records, and they don't necessarily have have to have them. You have to give permission to have your records sent. So it's not like everyone in the healthcare system is like is one thing. And you know, there's independent things. So if you want to share your records, especially in this area, there's a lot of different things. I know like down in Madison, a lot of them are part of like the same network. So that might be a little bit different. No, there's three main ones. Three they're main all separate. Ones. Three main ones, but they're all separate. Mm -hmm. So, so here, more in Glossa, they're kind of all separate. <laughs> so we have like a lot of little clinics. Well, here, I mean, it's just, it, there's a few, but mm -hmm. and, and if they're connected on the same EMR, which some of them are separate, but if they're on the same EMR, then then they have access to your records. So it just it just depends. Don't I guess the point is don't assume. Don't assume that they're, you know, and if you can help with that, um, 
getting the records, if there's certain things that you feel like are really important, you, know, you might want to communicate with your op the office that you're going to be going to and say, you know, I want to make sure that you have X, Y, Z records and you can do things to help with that. Um, as a patient, as a patient, you have a right to have to look at your records and have access to your records. So or to again, not have them sent. Because I think a lot of people don't like what maybe somebody else has put into the record in the past, saying that they're faking it and things like that. Right, does so, that look bad though? I mean, is that going to be the patient being dishonest if they're no. not with mm -hmm. disclosing that? No. And your doctor, you're making faces. <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have to be honest. Angie probably knows better than I do. I want honesty. Yeah. Angie, we don't get, we, when we request people's records, if someone schedules an appointment with me, I'm not in any system. I'm just, my clinic is just me. Um, and we get people's record, you know, we immediately, as soon as they schedule their appointment, you know, they or we start working on getting their records. It's continuing care, so I don't think we have to have a release, do we? When they come in, we have them sign a release if they want us to send our note to somebody else, but that's really like a double checking because it's continuing care. But some, so, some places, okay, so like in my clinic, we have a to and from. So you find, mm -hmm. sign one form that's releasing our records that's to different. release and for them to release records. But that's mental us. health, which is completely different. Than, that's completely different. Some well, of it is it's, completely different, but that part is the same. There's more protection around surrounding that. Some of them, yes. Yeah, yeah for, for different ages. I was just going to say, there, there is, though, what Dr. Bluestein says, like a continuation of care. You know, like if you were admitted to the hospital and we said, hey, where did you have this test done last? Who did you see last? And it's not part of the same electric system, electronic system, you, yes, like a unit clerk or whoever's obtaining the records can call and they will be automatically sent over. Mm -hmm. um, in our area, uh, Marshfield Clinic is the only one that needs an actual form signed from the patient. Like, I'm pretty sure still to date. Yeah, they but still otherwise, do Yes, but otherwise all of the other surrounding ones, records can be automatically sent for continuation of care without the patient agreeing, per se. I'm pretty sure that, that that's not it. right. <laughs> Are you honest with you? Yeah. But, yeah, they do. I'm just saying they do. Yeah. Does that so. work for out of state, too? But the thing is, too, if I could just say one more thing, um, Aspirus, UW, um, a lot of them are connected, again, right. into the same system, so there exactly. is no, you don't need to sign the sheet, is, the, exactly. is what I guess. Um, exactly. But, it, but it's just good to know as a patient that your records should not be signed without your consent. You need to have a signature. And it's not just behavioral health. Behavioral health is a little bit different in certain areas, but in this area, it's the same for, for matter of law behavior. Because I know like on certain EMRs, if you, if you go, if you try to access someone's behavioral health records, there's like a big warning, you better not enter this area unless you are specifically authorized to do so. So those records are treated as, as so just know that that's available and, and something that you can look into. And so um, also about record, amending your record. If you don't like something that the doctors put into your record, um, most places they're supposed to have, depending on, a lot of these are insurance company mandates. Um, so like for where I work at, uh, we have to have an amendment policy, and it actually goes with the Department of Quality Assurance. So, what ours is, and what a lot of them are, is if you don't like what the doctor said, the first thing that you have to do is you have to ask the doctor to change it. Um, like Dr. Lucine said, she can spend so many hours with the patient that maybe a word can be wrong or put in there and that, and that how it should have been. So, the first thing to do is actually the doctor can say no, like, no, I'm going to keep it there. Um, typically, the next step is going to be <clears throat> writing your side of the story, what you feel is wrong, and then, like, at my clinic, and I know about other places, that what they do is they actually insert what you wrote into your medical record right next to the discrepancy. And if anyone ever requests your records, that is automatically sent along. So maybe the doctor says this and you disagree, you want to put that in there. Um, 
They should give you a copy of this. It should be available to you. Um, and if it's not, I actually have the Department of Health and Human Services on here. Um, that's, that's who you need to contact. Same thing with the complaint policy and procedure. They need to have that available to you. They also need Can to give you about the record amendment. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bluestein, mm -hmm. how do you feel if parent, patients ask you to change something because they disagree or if you see that amendment put in there? So, so I haven't had that happen to yep. me as a physician, but I've had that happen to me as a patient. Um, I, when I got my records and I read through, and I've had this happen a lot of times. And because, yeah, I know mine, it's, there's tons of them. Right. And, <laughs> right. So there's a couple of things. One is, most of the time, it's, it's, it's purely misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time, you know, I, I, I hate to admit this, but I'm not, oh, I'm not writing the note at the time, you know, and sometimes it's a couple of days later because I, you know, I mean, I, for me, the priority is the patient that's in front of me, and then the paperwork comes, you know, second and third and fourth. Um, so, but so you're trying to, you know, and I take a lot of notes, but I'm, you have to recall, right? Yeah. So, and a lot of this is completely inconsequential. So when I've read my own records and I see that they've written things that are completely incorrect, I usually ignore it. But it did happen to me once where something was written about me that made me very upset. And I did. I requested to uh, plug in with the doctor and I let them know in advance that this was why I was coming in. I wanted to discuss what they had written in my record. And and we talked about it. And to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure that she had changed it, but I felt better knowing that I addressed it with her and said I, I, it was something particularly like, prejudicial. And I didn't want that a part of my permanent record. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it's in how you approach it. If one of my patients said to me, I want to talk to you about something, I've read this in my record, I would I would definitely want them to say that to me so that, yeah, okay, let's look at it, and oh, you meant this, or, you know, um, it's usually just a misunderstanding, mm -hmm. I think, most of the time it probably is. Yeah, because I just worry about affecting that doctor-patient relationship, you know, putting mm -hmm. okay. yeah. affecting the doctor-patient relationship. If you got something really good going with this doctor, but they're putting these things in, it's like, no, it's not that, like, that's not what happened. So to you know put that negative spin on it, would it affect something down the road? And, and it also you know this is not just an, an EDS thing. Honestly, yeah, yeah. Um, I I had this happen with with my parents, sister's parents, um, where I I requested you know what she brought me, what what our mom brought, and showed to me was like, wait, you didn't have a diagnosis of this prior to that appointment. And then based on your numbers, why would you have it? So, so I got, I asked for an original copy, you know, of that actual visit. I'm like, this is not, this is not right. So I told my mom, I said, I think you need to discuss that with them and say, why did you give me this diagnosis at the end of the visit? When, you know, so these things are definitely not that uncommon. And again, I think it's all on how you approach it. And because um, you want your records to be accurate. Now, some things are, you know, trivial. Well, <laughs> Now I've noticed like stuff copy and pasted from previous, yes. mm -hmm. and then that mistake carries yes. through yes. all the way, yes. and that's where it's a bigger issue. Yes, you're exactly right about that, mm -hmm. and um, that's something that you know we're not supposed to do. But I will tell you and that you I have patients to. I have patients that are on probably between medications and supplements, maybe 40 things, oh. and you have to put the name, you have to put the dose, the frequency, you know. And, and I'm to write that all out every single time, and especially because it's like, okay, you know, some of them are very complex. You know, it's not just it's not just yeah. vitamins or whatever yeah. else. So, um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. So, if a clinic is consistently copy pasted in that misinformation and it is prejudicial, can you just leave out that that medical doctor? Later, if it's no, you want to I mean, does that come back to bite you though, as a patient? Sure. I think if it was something that was repetitive, I would go to a higher up and I would tell them my amount of fix because it's inaccurate. Okay. You know, and especially if you got it fixed in one place, then go but it keeps showing up tell another. You guys need to fix this in all these places. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's their mistake, and, and it can be time-consuming for them. And it needs to get done. And if it doesn't get done, Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, yep. it's, they're, they're the people. See? Mm -hmm. and, and they should have this address available to you. And actually, one other thing I want to mention about this, so again, as an anesthesiologist in the OR, for over 20 years, I've, been, I've worked at many hospitals where the pharmacist 
would actually come to, even in outpatient surgery, the pharmacist would come to the patient's room and attempt medication reconciliation before I would be seeing the patient. And, and I say attempt, Whoa. because trust me, it is much harder than you think it is, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you think this, we've had, I've had this happen, you, know, you think that you're taking this, and then later on it's like, so, so again, I would rather that we, for medications, like, okay, misunderstandings, and try to, try to know your medications, as okay. it's in your best interest to know what you're taking as accurately as possible. And um, yeah, this is something that's it's challenging. I mean, you know, like I said, pharmacists will be in there, they'll be in there for a while. Like, okay, going through every single medication and how often and so. Thank you. But that's just one part of the record, obviously. Right. Any other parts. But that can still translate and yep. become a problem, right? Yep. Thank you. And there's a lot of other laws and regulations that we should know. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question regarding um, record amendment and going back to that doctor to talk about you know an, an error or something you don't agree with and because um, appointments being covered by insurance it really comes down to what the purpose of that appointment is put down for medical coding mm -hmm. so because I, mean, I have somebody I want to kind of go back and talk with about some things but I'm like I don't know what they're going to put in the coding it's not going to be a covered insurance service mm -hmm. for my purpose of coming in okay so you're afraid to have it amended because you think that it might not be covered by insurance? Right, because I don't know what they put that down for. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure. That's where you can get to this. Um, you, you can ask them. And then that, that's really the only way I would think to go about it to ask them about it. Ahead of time, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Would that be a situation where you could call your insurance and talk to them about it, maybe? Yeah, that Probably sounds like could. an insurance-related yeah. question. Because, I mean, at, at least I know that you, you, you actually have the option of saying that it's private or personal, you know, when you make an appointment. You actually can say that. However, that gives them no clue whatsoever what you're coming in for. Mm -hmm. And it's much better if you have some idea of what the person's coming for from a scheduling standpoint mm -hmm. and from, you know, multiple different standpoints. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but there are other laws that... If you're educated, you ask for the policy and procedures, they should be giving them to you, they should be giving you this information. The next thing, uh, the next tip that we want to give you is to be prepared. So, being prepared is also going to help anxiety. Um, I recommend a health finder, and health finders can look at a lot of different ways. Um, I just helped my aunt put one together because she so many things going on, and I mean, you want to have general information in there. There's also apps. I have an app on my iPhone. Are you guys familiar with this? It's a little heart shape, and if you, I should get my app. Is you know, actually help it? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's that's on, that, that comes with the phone, and actually, if you have that. Um, there's an option for having that available without having to unlock your phone. Yes. And I would strongly recommend that you do that. Somebody had a respiratory arrest. They stopped breathing at the EDS conference. Mm -hmm. And I was the one who got to resuscitate them. And we're trying to find oh out. Gosh. They were by themselves and trying to get information about this person who's unconscious. And if you have it in your phone that they can access. So on the lock the screen, um, they go to emergency. And then down here it says medical ID. So they can access whatever information you put into the health app. And I'll show you what the health app looks like too. So for mine, I have my pictures. Um, it has on here medical conditions, and I have my medical condition listed in, in order that is probably the most helpful. You kind of need to know that I'm going to tell you everything before they need, would need to know that I have sleep apnea. <clears throat> I have, under medical notes, I have my specialist. Um, allergies and reactions, and I put in there um, my medication metabolism problem, and that I can't swallow pills. My medications, which I keep this updated, which is really helpful when I go in for my appointments because I can just go back to the list. Um, height, weight, emergency contact. So all of that's in here. I can show you what that looks like. I'm pretty sure that there is one that comes in um, for like the Android phones. But this one looks, no, oh, mine's not going to be very big, but it's just a white box with a pink car on it. <clears throat> so that can be 
be really helpful. That and having a health minor, having everything together. Um, Dr. Boosting and I actually together created a patient worksheet that can be helpful for you to make your appointment. Does everybody get one of those when you patient? Hopefully 
doing something like this. <clears throat> I mean, what I what I envision is Peter in the beginning. He has all these things going on in his house. If he could write them down, walk into the contractor's office, and say, "Here, this is what's going on in my house." The contractor could then look at it. The doctor can look at it. You know, give him a minute. Like, like. I've seen a lot of people talk right to their doctor when they're reading something, and how can they listen to you and, and try to think and formulate what they what they need to do or come up with a plan. So it might take a few minutes to look at all this information, ask you some questions, and, and, and even when you answer questions, it's not about them not believing you. It's about, you know, what are you saying? Um, you can say, I broke my leg when I was 15, I was in a car accident, and this black car came out of nowhere, and blah, 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 blah. And all you're doing is like taking up more time with your appointment. It's not that your doctor doesn't believe you. Tell him you broke your leg when you're 15. You know, it really doesn't have to be more than that. The more time that they have to think about all these things, the better it is for you. They can come up with a plan, you adjust the most important symptom at that visit, make another appointment, come back, build that relationship. They're going to get to know you. And especially if you're honest, I think that's so important. Just being honest about your symptoms. You know, um, especially like with mast cell or with EDS, <coughs> that was so frustrating that one day my knee was hurting. By the time I got into the doctor, my knee wasn't hurting anymore. And now it's my elbow. And just be honest with them. I mean, I could have told them that my knee was still hurting, but that really wouldn't have done any good. It wouldn't help me to get my diagnosis. So you might not know why things change, but just always be honest with them. Um, about symptoms, there are subjective symptoms and there are objective symptoms. There's signs of symptoms. Yeah, objective symptoms are, I mean, we use the term signs and symptoms. So a sign is something that somebody else can see. And so a sign would be, you know, like a, like a rash that, you know, the other person can see. A symptom is something that you feel that nobody else can validate, that just you feel. So it, and there are certain symptoms, certain signs that have more meaning than other things. So. Uh, some of the really, really important ones are, you know, if you have a fever, and you actually measured it. Like, you know, whenever possible, try to measure something. Like, you know, if you had a rash or something, it was this big, take a picture of it. You know, if you can, you know, we, we like to measure things. We, we like numbers and, you know, things like that. So um, whenever possible, try to, try to describe your symptoms as best you can. But if you have a sign of something, that's really helpful because that's something that we can kind of sink our teeth into. So if you had a fever, something that that's something that's very concerning. If you had loss of function of a body part, um, you know that's something that's very very concerning. You know those are things that are, you know, can measurable, can, measurable, and can be more can indicate things that are more worrisome for us than you know some of the other things that, that people report. So you know, if you feel like you're having issues like with your blood pressure or something. You can get a home blood pressure cuff and actually take your blood pressure and then you know start a journal and kind of write the number and then you can just bring it in and kind of you know show them and they can kind of quickly scroll through. But it gives more, you know, this is the thing that's so hard is high blood pressure is you know pretty easy to treat. You've got numbers, you're treating the numbers, pain, it's it's the person is reporting it and there's so many factors and variables and things like that. So um, whenever possible, you know, really try to focus on well, what are the really worrisome things? Things that are that are um, escalating, something that's getting progressively worse. You know, be sure to mention that. Um, or or if it's waxing and waning, that's fine. But you know, try to like if I ask somebody, okay, when did this start? And they're like, well, was it ten days ago or eleven? Or you know, that doesn't matter. Like a general, you know, just kind of try to. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're going to have one of those forms filled out before you go. Mm -hmm. You don't have to waste the time thinking about when it started. And you can transfer that information to your next appointment, and you can keep a running list of your symptoms and how long you have them and things like that. So that well, well really actually, and speaking of a running list, people will say, well, I was in seventh grade. 
well, it's easier for me if you tell me in 2012, you know, whatever, whatever happened, because then when I put it in the record as 2012, that's always 2012. So years and years and years later, it's not two years ago, it was, you know. So again, <coughs> the more we can help each other, the better off, because honestly, we do have the exact same goal, which is to help people feel better. Really These loose papers that you take in the doctors, I know we moved here from another state, and in our state we were, they didn't want papers, so we could not have gotten in this. They would have said, sorry, you know, because they only did electronics, they didn't want to be handed anything. Is that different here? Well, even with electronic records, you can scan the information in. Okay, scan so information all the time. Okay, so and they still... They want. didn't want that, I don't think that that's right. Um, I I'm a list maker, mm -hmm. that didn't apply. I would say fill it out, make a copy of it, or give them the original. Um, you want to have a record for yourself of what you told them, but also, if you give them that sheet of paper, that's going to be in your medical record. Um, I actually had a doctor a couple years ago when something finally clicked and I figured this out. I brought him a piece of paper. I, I was working at a, a school assignment that day, and so I'm on my computer and I like, just typed up quickly what was going on and what information I wanted to bring to him. And I brought it to him, it was typed up, printed out. And he looked at it, tried giving it back to me. I'm like, no, you can have that. He's like, oh, and I suppose you have a copy of this at home too. He was not happy because now he is responsible for that information. Okay. So, so leave it there, even if it's suddenly shredded. He didn't like that. I mean, that really clicked in my mind. Like, like, I, I couldn't understand why he was so upset about it. I'm like, oh, now I get it. Now he can't ignore the information that I just gave him. I mean, right, there's, there's a section of every EMR, pretty much every EMR that is for scanned documents. Mm -hmm. But you have to go look for those scanned documents. Mm -hmm. So you can also, you know, if you're going to somebody and they're using an EMR, and you use this simply to organize your thoughts, but you don't leave it with them, exactly. you know, what? It won't help if we don't leave it. No, it will help. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. If you use it as a, that's why we called it a worksheet. If you use it to organize your thoughts, you go into the appointment and you just kind of use that as a frame of reference. And you, you know, again, I, you know, I think you, you want to, the, 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 the nice thing with people that have EDS is they generally tend to be pretty intuitive. So you could probably get a pretty good read as to what's going on in the room. So, you know, like use it as a as a worksheet, and if they want to take it, great. But you know, I don't know about saying you know here and, and really like forcing them to take it. Okay, because you can still get a lot of benefit out of it because you used it to organize your own thoughts, and then while you're in there, like you're not going to forget anything. That's why it's helpful to bring somebody with you. Yeah. Because right, I mean even 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 for me when I've gone to appointments, if somebody doesn't write anything down for me and they didn't give me, now people are much more commonly giving you a plan when you leave. But before they did that. I mean, I would be like, what was I supposed to do again? Right. You know, so it helps to have somebody with you, both for recording things, and especially if somebody else has observed something. You know, if you've had, like, loss of consciousness and things like that, bring somebody with you who has observed that, because that's, that's... And you as a patient would not take position, would not take that as an insult that someone else is in the room. Oh, gosh, no. Now, I don't like it if they bring 10 people. Because no, that's, but that's it's distracting. And, yeah. yeah, but one person that's not an I think it's. I think it's a very good idea. Yeah, and I yep. think it's just really helpful too, like to have everything written down. And if that person can help you write things down, they'll still be there. I agree. Absolutely. A, a reference for you um, to help explain if the doctor has more questions. So here's a summary um, of, the, of the tips that we've given you today. Um, having an open mind is really important, and that's going to be for patients and for medical professionals. Now if we look back at the information that we went through in the beginning, what patients want and what doctors want. So patients want to not have pain or other debilitating symptoms, and doctors want to fix their patient. It, it, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, it doesn't mean that they always can fix the problem, and that can be frustrating for them. Um, but also, I think what I, what I really want to point out here is that a lot of what we want to be believed, validation, reassurance, that's not going to take extra time um, for them. And 
there's no restriction on that. Um, so many of us have been through so much with medical appointments that I think that if a medical professional knows that they don't have to cure us in an appointment or in two or three or four or five appointments, but they can really, really help us just by giving us validation, just by listening. And even though we have all these things going on, they don't have to fix all those things, but they can help us by listening and validating us. My dog came up with a really cool thing. <laughs> She's right here. Thanks, Haley. She said, if you can't leave with an answer, at least you can leave with something, which is validation. Mm -hmm. And that's huge for people who are medically complex. Um, so with preparation, organization, and effective communication, everyone can win. having refreshments and raffle drawings in the lobby right after this. We do have our support group meeting in, if, if you go to this back hallway here, go down. It's called the Green Tech Room. It's the Green Room. We'll have some more snacks in there afterwards at 3.30. Like the worksheet that kind of preparing for appointment works well if you have a doctor who's willing to Try. I think a lot of my anxiety comes from when I go to a patient and they're like, you have EDS? I'm not touching you. Um, yeah. That's like, you know, you wait so long to get in with a specialist, you have all these hopes building up, you prepare for it, and then you walk in the door and they're like, you have EDS? I'm done. Like, that's the most anxiety building for me personally. And mm -hmm. I agree. it's hard to prevent. Are you forced to go to that provider for some reason? Um, well, I mean, I just was going for him for a surgical referral, and he was the only one who did it and networked for me. So, it was referred to him, and he's like, mm, I'm not touching you. You're like a black box. So, mm -hmm. so did you ask why? Because operating on a patient with EDS is like opening a black box. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, again, depending on what their rationale was, you yeah. know, I mean, you know, we don't heal like other people do, and surgery should always be taken very, very seriously with anybody, but yeah. especially with people that have EDS. So it depends on were they really not wanting to see you, or were they? No, they didn't want to see me. I went and saw three other surgeons who all agreed and got me to someone who was the best person to do it. Mm -hmm. and had to fight the out of network battle to do it. Mm -hmm. He just shut down because of EDS. Because mm -hmm. I went into the appointment and he was very, oh yes, talking about all my problems, and he looked at my records, he's like, you have EDS? And demeanor changed immediately. And it, okay, so I posted something on that same Sermo uh, group a while back, mm -hmm. and I said I, I, the title of it was "If fibromyalgia is the F word, is EDS the E word?" And I couldn't believe because I was curious to see like what are my colleagues saying about EDS, and I I do believe you completely mm -hmm. because there were some people that had some very negative things to say. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a combination of there are people that are, um, you know, they're burnt out for, right, they're, you know, they're exhausted, they're, you know, they are not in a place of, of being compassionate um, anymore. I don't know if they were, and now they're not, or, if, you know, and, um, I think it's they don't, hard. And they don't know, it, it is, it's very, very frustrating. It's really frustrating to not be able to fix someone. You're talking about fixing someone in one visit or two visits. I can't fix anyone with EDS, like ever. Yeah. I can I can help them to feel better, but I'm not going to cure them. But EDS, they're always going to have it, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but that doesn't mean that they can't feel better. That doesn't mean they can't improve their quality of life. And for me, it's all about function. Like, you know, I I'm not as concerned. Well, I should say that. For me, it's like, well, okay, maybe your pain numbers aren't that high, but are you really limited in what you can do from a functional standpoint? Let's get you doing the things that you want mm -hmm. to do. You know. Um, so EDS is very uh, misunderstood within the medical community. I've been trying to change that ever since I got really involved in this about a year and a half ago. I wrote an article, a CME article that you know got a fair bit of attention, and then I, um, with um, EDS awareness, chronic pain partners, we developed a CME program that has been you know well received that provides online free education for physicians about EDS because it is. 
very misunderstood, and it's one of those things that, um, I mean, you're right, there are probably a lot of people that they, they don't want to deal with it. They see that and they think, you know, because fibromyalgia is the same way. A lot of people see the diagnosis of fibromyalgia and they immediately think, I don't want to deal with this person because I am, and I think it, I think it comes back to I'm not going to be able to win. And, and it's not about them winning, but it's, yeah. you know, in their mind, I think that's the problem. And I wonder too if certain of it's more they're concerned about their outcomes and they're not. Yes, because, absolutely. Which, yeah. and that's exactly right. why. It's frustrating. Like, can't there be some sort of thing taken into consideration? Like, where if you're taking on that complicated patient, it doesn't count, you know? Now, one thing I do want to say about that is to keep in mind, again, my husband is a physician, he's yep. a surgeon. And over the years, you know, he's the same age I am, his approach has changed dramatically. And, and so did mine as an anesthesiologist. Over my 20 plus year career, you become more conservative, you learn from the bad things that have happened. So, you know, I don't know if you've already had your surgery or it's upcoming or whatever. Nope, it's done, I'm a year out and doing really great. So. Yeah. So, but, but just keep in mind that, it, that medicine is not, you know, we call it the art of medicine for a reason. And, um, you know, I certainly have had conversations with my colleagues where they thought that this was the right way to do it. I thought this was the right way to do it. There, I mean, there isn't a right answer to a lot of things. So your surgeon, I mean, you're probably <laughs> right that they were, because there's, you know, sort of different, there's a difference between like yeah. labeling you and not wanting to deal with you and thinking, this is higher risk than I want to take, and maybe they're, they're um, it's, it's not that they're being a bad person, it's that they really think that it's the right thing to do for you. Does that make sense? And that is exactly why we need more research, more education, more support for these doctors, and resources for them. Because the more that we help them, the more that they can help us. I mean, we really, really need to work with them. They are not up to get us. They're not our enemies. I mean, there's so many other things that are at play. There's insurance companies, there's laws. I mean, there's outcomes. There's so much, and there's not enough information out there to help us. And, and, and we just have to keep working together. You know, we have to keep pushing to get more answers. We have a message from a webinar participant. Okay, so it's from Kendra. It says, oh, Hi Kendra. <laughs> Hi Kendra. <laughs> it says preparing questions ahead of time is key, specific to that appointment. We often verbal vomit in times of stress or because everything is pertinent and providers are often asking and have to ask for everything. However, our histories are long and vast. Sometimes the information isn't pertinent, some is. A timeline of events or, or medical history bullet pointed can sometimes help and integrate for your chart. Bring copies or ask to make a copy. A patient worksheet like Tammy is sharing is super helpful for us and our providers. It also helps us think about possible outcomes and assess what you as a patient want out of the visit. What are your ultimate goals? Cure is great, a miracle therapy is amazing, but it could ultimately mean having someone willing to walk your journey with you, believe you, and be a partner in your healthcare, part of your team. Visualize and practice verbiage that is concise. We often need to admit and quit it quick and without being on the defense before we walk through the door. We have to be prepared to state the problem, what we are asking for or propose, and what we are asking the provider to do or help with. Visualizing positive outcomes, taking a few deep breaths to gain composure and calm anxiety or nerves before the provider walks in, and being mindful of what always happens, thoughts that could possibly allow head trash to derail a potentially impactful and productive appointment. It's a partnership and it goes both ways, but if we do our due diligence and the provider doesn't meet us halfway and with respect, then we have to be okay with walking away. Have a plan to deal with disappointment and add appointment trauma pain, i.e. visualize possible outcomes and plan on how to deal with them. Thank you, Kendra. Kendra is from EDS Wellness, if you're not familiar with EDS Wellness. She's the founder and president of EDS Wellness. Yes. She's amazing. She's great. Like the Facebook page, go to their web. She has so much information out there. She's great. And that's a good point. What you were saying, you know, do you feel like they were being disrespectful of you? That's completely different than I think that word respect was, you know, that she Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question too, another one. Yeah. Um, so I often will go in with like two or three questions I want to ask and discuss beforehand, like regarding care, you know, different things. I've debated like whether I should send those questions to the doctor through my chart before the appointment, saying, oh, I want to discuss these at the meeting. And you're... It, was that helpful, or would you rather just have it be sh there at the appointment? Like, 
for me personally, yeah. I I would probably rather have that in advance. Mm -hmm. If it's not, especially if it's something that maybe I wouldn't be otherwise anticipating. Yep. I mean, if it's fairly, if I've seen you fairly recently, and I kind of, it's it's more of a continuation of what we've been yep. doing. That's different. But if you had something unusual come up, and especially if it might affect the length of your appointment, mm -hmm. or something you know that um, wasn't anticipated, then I think actually sending that in advance is a good idea. Okay. So. And probably every provider's going to have different preferences. Um, same with like if you want to bring an article to share that kind of thing. Would you rather have that beforehand? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> because that's that, pressure. Because, because now I I mean I, I get inundated with yep. stuff, and I wish I had all day every day to you know I wish I didn't need to sleep ever because I, I seriously could I love to do research I love 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 to do research but there's only so many hours in the day and unfortunately I don't need to sleep so. Um, that's a good question. I would say that it depends on what it is, maybe, and it depends on how it relates to that appointment. One note that I made before this was, um, I don't know if, if any of you guys are on Twitter, but you know, I do this all the time. Like, I'll write something on Twitter, and then I realize that it's too many words, so I have to cut out words, right? Mm -hmm. If you think of it like a Twitter feed, and now i got to cut it out to the, you know, and, that, and, and actually that's what we had to learn to do when, um, when you're doing your internship. And like for me, I had to do an internal medicine internship. So you're going around and you have all these patients and then when you're making rounds, your whole team is walking from room to room to room and you're presenting your, pa your patient to your staff. Well, we had to figure out, like distill down to what are the really core important things, you know, to, to mention. So um, that's a skill. You know, it, it really is a skill. So don't feel bad that it's, you know, but I really digress from your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know exactly where the information is that I want the doctors to mm -hmm. see. It's the last paragraph on page eight. And so mm -hmm. I'll highlight it. Highlight it. I mean, because <laughs> I, mean, I had, when I read the article, sometimes they're like, oh yeah, I'm aware of that one. It's good. I don't need it. And sometimes they're like, no. And sometimes it's like, oh, let me see this. Like, and they're like, I wish I had more time to look at this. I'm like, oh, if I would have sent it sooner, but you never know which way it's going to go. Correct. And actually, you raise an excellent point, which is, Especially now, I've gotten so busy that I have, um, I really, really appreciate it when people are, um, so I do have let patients email me, which I've heard lots of people say, don't, don't do that. Because then it's, it's, it's one other, you know, time consuming thing, but I love it when people give me like a yes or no question or something, you know, when they make it easy for me to yeah. respond to them rather than when they give me links to 12 different articles and be like, so what do you think of this? <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I think that it really depends on how you approach it and if you, remember, remember that they have a lot of patients. Again, I'm going to, um, remember dad was, my father was, I don't understand. My cardiologist and my internist are both in the same building. Why can't they meet in the stairwell to talk about me? But I have to tell you, you have to remember that, that they have lots and lots of patients. And, and so, um, you know, it, with certain people that are really, really complex, sometimes there are, you know, meetings like that. But it's, unfortunately, our society is not, or our current healthcare system is not set up well to take care of medically complex people. I hope it's going to get better. And we were having a conversation <coughs> started about um, uh, pain rehabilitation centers and those are that's really the optimal place to get pain because it's multi um, uh, multi departmental what is what I'm trying to say disciplinary <laughs> thank you it's multidisciplinary and then they are working together but the system is set up that way whereas most systems are not set up the way I trained I trained at the Mayo Clinic and that's one thing I think Mayo Clinic does really really well is they communicate within departments even if you're just going in for a more routine type of visit They'll communicate with the, the system is set up very well to do that. They can easily send each other messages and, and so, yeah. So, I, I, I've been there as a patient. I did my training there. I've gone back there as a patient. And that is one thing that, you know, that they do well. Yeah. But a lot of other places don't. So, we should probably wrap it up. But we will still be here if you guys have questions. Um, it is quarter after three. Um, but thanks to our volunteers because without them, this would not have happened. Um, it really takes a coordination of a lot of people, and um, I'm super excited for Wisconsin that we have people here that are working together so well to be able to help us to get what we need. Um, and 
also our donors and supporters. I don't have um, Dr. Bluestein's clinic, which is here in Wassa, Wisconsin, Integrative Pain Specialist, but she is on our website. So you can find her there. Please find her there. Um, but we really appreciate um, all of you guys coming also. Thank you. Do you admit to doctors that you have anxiety? What's that? Do you admit to the adopters? Are you are you asking? Is it a good idea to admit? Yes, I think it is a good idea. Okay, so I suppose that. Yes, I think because and I think that it's a good idea to say why. Like I am anxious about this. I'm just letting you know I'm anxious about this because it means a lot to me. It's this is very important to me. This is like my, my one chance to get help. So I I I think it's a good idea to mention it. And if I have a history of ten doctors, right, really bad experiences. Do I avoid talking about that? I think I think again it depends on if your your demeanor and how you say it. Like I'm I'm anxious about this because I've had some bad experiences in the past, but I'm really happy to meet you and I'm really you know again if they feel like they're you're holding that against them, then they're going to start off defensive and it's probably not going to go well. But if you are honest with them, if you're honest and open and like, but I'm willing to give you a chance. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Being right up here. <laughs> well, that's might you admit if I your anxiousness. But a quick reminder, everybody, to fill out that survey. It's on the oh. very back. Yeah. That little half sheet. If you could quick fill that out, rip it off, and then we'll just start a little pile here. Oh, yeah. And then for a door prize, right? That would actually work for a or something like that. Sure, yeah.